Welcome to Coffee Chat with Phoenix number 11. Today's Coffee Chat is a Q&A where I'm gonna answer questions that you sent to me. Grab a beverage of your choosing and let's dive in. I've organized these by topic, so if I hit on a topic that isn't really relevant to you, check out the timestamps in the description. You can jump ahead to a topic that is more relevant to your situation. And if you submitted a question that I don't cover in this video, Never fear, it's possible that either I didn't have time to get to it today, or it was such a good idea that I plan on making an entire video about it. So just know that all of your questions were read and appreciated. Topic number one is group lessons. And question one comes from Carmen. After 35 years of teaching private lessons, I started two group lessons last year. One is going great and the other is frustrating. In the frustrating group, the students are all the same age at a private school during the day, but one is not talented and doesn't practice. One practices, but you can't tell. One practices a little, so manages to keep up, and one is talented and practices. I am using Piano Adventures Primer and they were all in third grade. I feel frustrated that I have to help the one who doesn't practice so much. Actually, she forgets her books every week too. While I have others that get neglected. None of them are doing as well as I think they should be. And I am thinking about backtracking to where the notes on the staff begin. Do you have any suggestions? Why yes, I do. One of the caveats of group lessons is that you're always gonna have a rising star student and a straggler student in every group. It's inevitable. <laughs> One of the things I love about group lessons, partner lessons, and private lessons in my own studio is that I can kind of place people in different groups, regroup, switch people to private lessons, switch private students to group lessons, etc., based on what I'm observing. So know that when you put a group together, it might not be the perfect ideal group, or it might be ideal, but only for a year or two. So group lessons are not like a permanent thing for those students working together. So if you have some flexibility to regroup a little bit, sometimes that can solve 85% of your problems. Also, I observe how students do, especially beginners in a group lesson, and it kind of lets me know, I think, oh, this student would be perfect to partner with that student, or this student could really use private lessons, etc. When you're mid-semester teaching a group, that doesn't really help you. You might have plans to regroup at the next break, but what do you do right now? I have some ideas. Number one is that you have to let go of the expectations that group lessons are going to be exactly the same as private lessons. Because when you're teaching a one-on-one -on -one lesson, you can pivot, change the curriculum, repeat the same page eight times if you need to, jump ahead. You can do whatever that student needs in the moment. With group lessons, it's not exactly the same. It's a little more similar to a classroom setting. We're always gonna have like some that are a little bit bored and some that are a little bit confused. And then you have the average people in the middle. And that's just part of the group setting experience. Kids are actually used to that because that's how school is. Now the beauty of a small group is that we can still do some pivoting and we can still move the straggler along and we can kind of feed the rising star some extra challenges on the side. So here are some ideas. First of all, chill out a little bit with your expectations of the group as a whole. It's okay if the straggler who doesn't practice doesn't really get all of the songs before you move on to the next page. If they're not practicing, they're not bringing their books, that's kind of a sign that maybe Maybe they're not in it with their whole heart and soul and maybe their family isn't either. So it would be a shame if you were spending all of your time on that student when the rising star is the one that's actually going to be your student for 10 years and really is going to put their heart and soul into the piano. So keep that in mind, like if the straggler is only playing half of the notes right and you move on to the next song, but the average student or students and the rising star are getting it, that's okay. Don't beat yourself up for that. The straggler doesn't have to play it as well as the rising star in order for the whole group to move on to the next page. Also, you can do a lot of supplemental and lateral movement with a group. So repeating the same concept with a different song. So I like to use the Wonder Keys book with my groups, 
the Wonder Keys Primer books with my own supplemental like games, activities, worksheets, songs that I write for them, and then also their special song projects. So another thing that you can do to sort of challenge the rising star and help the straggler along is by doing a rotation of lesson types. So on week A, you're going to do a group lesson where everybody is working on the same thing at the same time. Usually this is where I'm introducing a new page, a new theory concept, a new note, whatever the case may be, or we're doing like a review activity or a game, something that's going to be best served by us all doing it together. And then on week B, I'm meeting with each student individually. While I'm meeting with each student, the other students have an activity. So I'll set up like a rotation station situation that was too much rhyming, in the studio. So they'll have a little theory activity or the two of them will be playing like a game together or something like that while I'm working with the individual student. And then we switch spots, we switch spots as many times as we can in the lesson span. Here's where I'm gonna give them their own individual song pick. So the rising star is gonna get either a challenging piece of sheet music or a more challenging book that is just theirs. And then the average student is gonna get their own book or piece and the straggler is going to get like a review piece or a retrograde piece to try to bring them up to speed or a lateral piece that's the same, but just repeating the same concept, something like that. And in that way, I can sort of give them like a mini private lesson within the group lessons. So I hope that helps a little bit to navigate that situation. I totally understand where you are coming from. Moving on to topic number two, which is onboarding new students. Molly asked, what is the most effective and efficient way to onboard new interested clients? Consultations, free first lesson, etc. I know that there are some studios out there that automatically give everybody a free trial lesson, and that is their way. They're just, that's how they get people in the door. And I can see the value in that. Personally, I find it most efficient to do a two email system. So I do not do any uh, face-to-face consultations or free trial lessons unless the situation dictates. So the first email that I send once I get the inquiry is um, general information. I try to keep it like fun and upbeat. I don't give like all the details and the policies and the boring stuff just yet. I tell them about the teacher, the openings. I give them a monthly tuition rate, but I don't give any details about paying or anything like that. I let them know, hey, we have these fun events uh, every year. We have these recitals. We have these opportunities. We do this. We do that. So like the, the features of taking lessons at my studio is what I start with. And then at the end of the first email, I say, we would love to answer any questions you have, let you know more details and get you signed up for your first lesson. And if at that point they are ready to sign on the dotted line, then their email back to me will be like, we like this opening, we can start on this date, let's do it. And most of my inquiries end up that directly just signing up for their first lesson. Then in my second email, here's the cost breakdown, here's how you pay me, here's the policies, here's where you sign, here's the info I need. And then they'll just need to sign that and give me the okay sometime before the first lesson. But that is the most efficient way, the two email system. Now, once I send that first email, If the email I get back has a lot of questions or concerns or um, they had a previous experience with another teacher or something like that, if it feels like they have some doubt and they're not ready to sign on the dotted line just yet, then that's where I will say, would you like to hop on a phone call? I can answer your questions or would you like to schedule a trial lesson with no obligation to sign up? So I really only do that in cases where it seems like it's needed or appropriate. So I hope that gives you some guidelines. Yeah, I have my two email templates. I always, always personalize them, but they give me the starting point of what I wanna say in email number one and email number two. Okay, topic three is recital venues. So question three, Cecilia asked, how to find affordable but nice recital venues and how to include or incorporate online students into a live in-personal, in-person recital. I have found it very hard to find churches willing to host a recital or they charge a very high fee. Thanks. Yes. Churches are very hard to schedule a recital 
with, I have found as well. In fact, I've completely given up on churches. They really only want like their own congregation, you know, meeting there. Pre-pandemic, I always had the attitude of like, I don't want to spend any money on the recital because I need to save my family some money. That's, I had a very frugal approach to it. And so I had a variety of nursing homes that would allow us to have their recital there for free. Obviously, when the pandemic hit, that was not an option. After the couple years of the pandemic, I kind of rethought the whole process. And I looked at venues that I thought would be appealing, fun, a good experience. And I expected to pay for them. So now I pay between $300 and $600 for a recital venue for the afternoon. And yes, it is expensive. And yes, my families now pay either a $20 or a $25 recital fee per performer, but they don't mind. They actually, I get emails after the recitals like, oh, that was such a great venue. We loved it. We loved the experience. I was having my recital at an art gallery for a long time. And if you saw this video, you know that that is no, no longer an option. That was a whole drama there. But this last recital, I had a piano store. Again, they charged me to use their recital hall, but it was great. The piano was really nice and it all worked out really nicely. So in my experience, the parents are looking for a great experience for the recital, someplace they wanna to go to, someplace that's beautiful and comfortable. And in my case, they don't mind paying a fee for that. So hopefully, if you expand your horizons and expect to start charging your families a little bit for that, if they're okay with that, then really that opens up a lot of possibilities. Hopefully there's some cool venues in your area that would have a nice piano for you. As far as incorporating online students, um, there are ways that you can do this live, like to live stream onto a laptop, onto a projector. If your venue did have the option to do that, you would wanna make sure that they had like the technology to hook up your specific computer to the projector. And there's potentially some technical difficulties that could arise with that, especially if you're not totally versed in how to do that. But one thing you could do is to record or have the students record their recital pieces like as high quality as they can at their home. And then you could edit those together with some nice titles and stuff and upload that to uh, if you have a studio YouTube channel as an unlisted video. It would be like an online recital. It's not live. So I realize it's not really the same thing. But recording is still a great way to kind of put that pressure on the performer so they feel like they're performing, so they get that experience. And then you can send the link of the unlisted video to all the performer, all your online students, and they could have like their own mini recital. Or if you record your live recital, then you could add them on as a recorded, you know, part of your recital recording so that others could see their hard work as well. So hopefully that gives you some ideas. Let us know how that goes if you do try that. Topic number four is worksheets. Susan commented, you have so many fabulous ideas. I like the idea of printing out colorful games, etc. but I only have a black and white printer. Any suggestions on a good color printer that doesn't cost an arm and a leg for colored ink? Boy, you said it, Susan, you said it. It's the ink, like the printers are not that expensive, but it is the ink. Currently, I have uh, this printer, which is a laser printer, and it was definitely investment. But not only was the printer an investment, these cartridges that I have to get for it, oh my goodness, they are expensive. Before I invested in this one though, I had something like this. If you get an HP printer, then you have the option to do HP Instant Ink. And if you're planning on printing a lot of color things, like some colorful posters to jazz up your studio, some full color games and stuff like that, color worksheets are just automatically more fun, I gotta say. Then you sign up for HP Instant Ink. You let them know about how many pages you're gonna print and you pay a flat monthly fee. And as long as you don't go over your pages, you're just paying the same amount every month. 
because with the HP Instant Ink, one page with one word printed on it in black ink is the same as one page in full rainbow color. They both count as one page. So if you're printing a lot of like full color things, you're really gonna get a good bang for your buck with the HP Instant Ink. And then they can sense when your printer is running low and they automatically ship you the ink whenever you're running low. So I did that for many years and that was very convenient, I have to say. Along the lines of worksheets, question five is from Blue Pool 210. I'm really impressed with your worksheets and have been wondering how to get started with creating similar ones, especially the coloring ones. I love them. Oh, thank you. I love them too. <laughs> so I'm not going to answer this question because this is like, this goes beyond being its own video. This is like its own workshop. So I'm asking you, yes, you watching this, would you be interested in some sort of like tutorial course workshop on how to create your own music theory worksheets? If so, I want you to comment below because if there is enough interest, I would be happy to make that, but I do feel like that would be like a whole deal, you know? So maybe, maybe let me know if that you're interested in that. Okay. Our final topic for today is me personal. Let's get personal. Cecilia commented, first off, I love your channel and look forward to all of your videos. Love you, Cecilia. What hobbies do you enjoy when you're not teaching or working? Do you take any time off in the summer or do you teach year round? Coffee or tea? How do you balance teaching in the evening and time with your daughter? Thanks for all you do to invest in piano teachers. Love it. Love it. Okay. So what hobbies? So actually this right here, what I'm doing right now is my main hobby because this is like not bringing in any income right now. And it takes up so much of my time, the blog, the website, the digital resources, the YouTube channel, all of that. Let's just go ahead and call that my hobby right now. It's basically what I do when I'm not teaching. However, I do love going for walks outside. I walk every day. I get my 10,000 steps every day. I love reading. I read every night for 10 minutes before I go to sleep. I do like going to concerts and listening to music and writing music. I feel like I haven't been doing as much of that, but I do enjoy that very much. Um, same with like movies and TV. Like I love sci-fi, um, but again, haven't really been doing that so much lately because I'm busy with other stuff. Uh, I do like to crochet as well. Composing piano solos. Did I already say that? Baking sometimes. Again, used to. I just don't have time anymore. <laughs> do you take any time off in the summer or do you teach year round? I do teach year round. I don't take any like big blocks of breaks, but I will tell you, I only teach 40 weeks out of the year. So I never go really longer than four or five weeks of teaching before I take a week off. So that honestly, that kind of helps my sanity year round. Coffee or tea? Yes. All of the above. We start the day with a nice hot cup of green tea. Usually after breakfast, it's iced coffee time. And then in the late afternoon, when I don't feel like I am supposed to have coffee anymore, then I'll have my iced tea. <laughs> so yes, yeah, definitely all. How do you balance teaching in the evening and time with your daughter? That is a tricky one. I would love, 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 love to build up my other streams of income enough that I could drop another night of teaching because that is definitely you know, my heart being pulled in two different directions, basically. I currently teach on Monday nights, Wednesday nights, Thursday nights, Saturday daytime. And so I do have Tuesdays and Fridays and Sundays off, which is great. But yeah, I would love to drop one more night of teaching. Uh, yeah, so one of the thoughts behind all of my different side hustles is that I would be able to make enough money to live on outside of teaching. And then I would still teach, but have less students. That would be ideal. By the way, I'm just feeling called to throw this out here. I feel a little weird saying it, but if you are still here, you're still watching, you're one of the OGs of the channel. 
and you love my videos, first of all, I love you too. Uh, there are some ways that you can definitely support the um, this project, the Tattooed Piano Teacher as a whole. Uh, one of them is to simply just click on my videos and watch them. If you watch a video to the end, that actually boosts my videos and helps others see it. Also, liking and commenting tells YouTube that people are engaging with it. Even if you just leave me a thumbs up emoji, you know, you don't have to say anything too <laughs> profound, but anytime you like or comment on a video, that helps me out too. Those are ways that you can support me without spending a dime. And if you are interested in investing in this so I can continue doing this and grow the channel and the business and the community and all of that, monetarily speaking, um, there is a link in the description of all of my videos to donate directly to me. It's on buymeacoffee.com. And then also, if you feel called to check out my digital resources that I make that are like printables for music theory, I sell those on teacherspayteachers.com. I'll leave that link in the description as well. And I'm working on a set of books called Piano Skill Set Books. They are theory and technique books. And if you want to check those out, I'll leave that link in the description as well. Anything you buy from me, a portion of that profit goes directly in my pocket as well. And all of those things help me to continue doing this. And I thank you. Okay, one more personal question from Buzz in Bethan. If there's one book that's changed your teaching, which one would it be? You know, I don't know that there's one book that has been super instrumental into my teaching education or teaching style or anything like that. If I had to pick one book, it would be a book that I talked about in this video recently in great length. So I won't talk about it too much, but I'll leave the link in the description to that video and also to that book. It's called a piano teacher's legacy. So this is one of the first like specifically piano teaching books I ever read. And although I wouldn't say that it was life-changing, I will say that it's one of the most inspirational piano teacher books overall that I've read and kind of got me thinking in an alternative way about teaching the piano and not becoming a cookie cutter teacher, I guess I would say. All right, bonus question to leave you with. Cecilia commented, great video, very helpful to see this in action. This was on a video I did in December of my goals for the year. So this is like my goal setting video. So I'll link to that as well. Are you going to check in halfway through the year? Well, here we are, it is halfway through the year. So yes, I would love to do a check-in video where I talk about, am I halfway to reaching my goals for 2024? I would love to share that with you, but I have a feeling this video is getting quite long. So I am going to record that on a separate video. And when that goes live, I will pop it right here. Until then, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of the video. See you in the next one.